Good evening and welcome to the American Society of Pain and Neuroscience webinar series. Um, Aspen is presenting the CME webinar series and the first as the intradiscal biologics. The webinar will begin in just one minute to allow some additional folks time to log on. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. The webinar will begin in one minute. Good evening and welcome to everyone for joining the Aspen CME webinar series, Intradiscal Biologics. We are so excited that you are here with us tonight. We will begin the webinar in just one minute to allow a few more people to join us. Again, thank you so much for joining the Aspen CME webinar series. The Intradiscal Biologics lecture will begin in just one minute. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the American Society of Pain and Neuroscience. Aspen is now presenting a CME webinar series, and the first in this series is Interdiscal Biologics. We are so incredibly excited that you have joined us this evening. I would like to introduce our moderators, Dr. Timothy Deere and Dr. Dawood Syed. Um, thank you so much, gentlemen, for leading this webinar tonight. Here are the disclosures. And Dr. Deere, take it away. Actually, Dr. Syed Dawood, uh, you want to say hello? Sure. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, it's, again, uh, really fun to have uh, all of our friends uh, tuning in uh, on these webinars and people that we're uh, newly getting acquainted to. You know, I think we've uh, now had uh, over a couple thousand people tune into our webinars over the last uh, several weeks here. Uh, I'm really excited about this and as Aspen's pledge is to continue to put out really unique content that's really not being put out there by anyone. So I think regenerative medicine is a topic that, you know, I think we all have some intrigue around. Um, I've looked at it, you know, uh, as something that I've been waiting for the science. So it's really my pleasure to bring, you know, really the, the international thought leaders on regenerative medicine and bringing them here today uh, to discuss with you real true science and data around this uh, intriguing topic. Uh, Tim? Uh, Dawa, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us again tonight as we get uh, close to about 5,000 total people in these webinars over the last uh, two months. So it's been an amazing journey. But tonight's a unique journey. It's, as you know, CME accredited. So you have a chance to get CME from this. But I also think tonight's unique because uh, it goes back to a topic that I find fascinating. And I have been a skeptic uh, at times over the years in regenerative medicine. But then I've been excited at times. And what I've always wondered is, is there evidence? What is the evidence to support this so that we can offer it to our patients? And so tonight, over the next hour and 15 minutes or so, you're going to hear a fascinating discussion from the world experts in the areas of studies in this arena uh, on the intradiscal disease and how we may treat that in a regenerative fashion. So as you see here on the agenda, we have some amazing speakers. We're going to look at um, things like the prevalence and, and who has regenerative disc disease. We're going to get some, some single blinded randomized studies looking at this uh, therapy, intradiscal FDA studies to date and an overview, We're looking at 12-month data, We're looking at complications of what would be the negative side of it so you have some balance, and then we're going to look at how you may integrate that into your practice. Here are our, our objectives for the next hour and 15 minutes or so. Um, we're going to discuss some utilization of these uh, precursor cellular allografts, regenerative medicine in the disc. I think that's going to be very important. Look at evidence for uh, single and double level lumbar degenerative disease with or without radiculopathy. So does it help the patient with the classic you know, modic changes or is it someone who has chronic radicular disease? Can we avoid surgery uh, with these therapies? And we all know the, the 
the complication of post laminectomy type syndromes can be quite severe for the patient. And then where is it in the algorithm? Where is it as opposed to injections or spinal cord stimulation or fusion? Where does it lie? And then what are the indications? And what can we back up by research as opposed to someone opening up an office in the middle of a, of, of a, of a mall and saying they're having intradiscal uh, stem cells or biologics. So those are our goals tonight. And with that, to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dawood Sayed. Thanks, Tim. So uh, as you, everyone will uh, notice today, you were, this will be broken up into different sections. Uh, our first section will be um, presented by uh, Dr. Michael De Palma, who really needs no introduction. Uh, I've kind of admired his work from afar and have gotten to know him better over the last uh, year or two uh, and really uh, admire the work he's done. He's going to go into the prevalence and predictors of the degenerative lumbar intervertebral disc. Michael, take it away. Thank you, Dawood and Tim, uh, for the uh, the kind introduction as well. I'd like to thank Aspen for organizing this evening's uh, CME event. Uh, collectively, uh, the panel tonight has been involved in um, intradiscal regenerative medicine clinical trials for the past 14 years, and we've never been more excited than we are now as we, we now have published peer-reviewed outcomes data, which you will hear more about over the next 60 to 70 minutes. Uh, first, I'm going to try to uh, lay the groundwork with some framework as to why we would uh, want to think more closely about intradiscal reparative or intradiscal regenerative strategies. And I think we need to first kind of start with this, examining this question, can the source of chronic low back pain be identified? And, and frankly, I remember learning as a resident and reading uh, that the source of chronic low back pain could not be identified uh, in upwards of 90% of patients. And that's actually the lead sentence of this 1990 paper from Spine, a reputable spine journal. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the derivation of this notion uh, is a 1966 paper by two uh, general British practitioners who in their practice, using uh, their skill set of generalists and x-rays, could not identify the source of back pain in 80 to 90% of their, their patients. So uh, this is, a, a, of course, a dated paper, as I mentioned, from 1966, but this is where the notion that we can't identify the source of back pain stems from. Fast forwarding to, to contemporary times, this conclusion is no longer valid, no longer supported. Since then, with the advent of advanced imaging, um, and refinement and validation of, of um, diagnostic procedures, the contrary is now true. We can identify the source of chronic back pain in, in most patients. When we look at the, uh, the global data, this uh, slide represents prevalence estimates for discogenic back pain uh, from three different continents. Now, the red numbers are the prevalence estimates for discogenic back pain, and then the, the horizontal bars represent the 95% confidence intervals. Uh, but the point here is that between 35 to 50% of, of all chronic low back pain patients have a painful disc as a source of their symptoms. And there is a correlation with age. The mean age of discogenic low back pain patients is 40, low to mid 40s, 41 to 46, depending on which paper you look at. Um, it's interesting to note that the mean age of joint pain, be it facet joint or SI joint, is 60. And some of the uh, findings from my research team a number of years ago found that there was an association between age and the probability of the source of low back pain with the younger age, here we go. So on this, this graph representation, age is along the x-axis, probability is on the y-axis, and the younger the patient, the higher the probability that patient has a painful disc. Conversely, the older patient is more likely to have a painful joint, be it facet joint or SI joint. Now, when we look at the disc a little more close, closely, the strongest predictor of concordant pain during disc stimulation is outer anode disruption. So on the left-hand portion of the slide here is a post-discography CT scan. 
axial cut demonstrating the a left posterior lateral annular fissure with a circumferential um, annular tear. And this is the morphologic substrate for discogenic low back pain, or at least one of them. Implate mediated pain is another entity that we have to learn more about. So when we anesthetize these, these discs that are painful using, in this case, we uh, years ago had a uh, uh, balloon tip catheter from Kyphon. We could fill the, the tip of the catheter with contrast and it would stay anchored in the disc allowing us to do controlled anesthetization of the disc. Well, 80% of these painful discs, once anesthetized and the patient did functional maneuvers, 80% of the disc had at least 50% reduction in the index low back pain. So data from, from this study corroborated or, or supported the fact that the annular fissures stimulating dur during discography are the source of clinically meaningful chronic low back pain. So it appears that the disc is a common source of back pain in adults, younger adults primarily, and a reason the disc can become painful is it develops an annular tear that doesn't heal. So now the question is, how do we detect these painful discs? And then if this patient here were to present to our office with this MRI in hand, we might have a hard time uh, discriminating a painful disc from a non-painful disc, or where is the pain coming from in this patient's case? And furthermore, a handful of studies dating back to Scott Bowden's early work in the early 90s have shown that patients without complaints of low back pain demonstrate various morphologic abnormalities on their MRIs, such as disc degeneration and, and disc herniations, and the incidence of these abnormalities increase with advancing age. Furthermore, well, there are two there are two morphologic abnormalities on imaging that increase the odds by a small amount that a disc is painful. High intensity zone lesions as demonstrated here, a, a uh, increased signal uh, change that's iso intense with CSF, and then severe type one and type two modic changes also when present increase the odds by a small amount that that disc level is symptomatic. And at the top here are type one modic changes and the lower portion here are type two modic changes. So those are two findings on MRIs that may, uh, that may help the clinician, guide, guide the clinician in their, in their decision making. Now, history of present illness, physical exam findings, and pain draw, drawings uh, based on, on data from the mid to late 90s were shown to be unreliable in detecting disc pain versus facet joint pain. But more recently, we've come to learn that the presence of midline low back pain, and midline low back pain we define as pain in line with the spinous processes, the presence of midline low back pain reduces the odds that the patient has a painful joint, be it a set or SI joint, whereas discogenic back pain could be midline or paramidline implication. Uh, SHF stands for sustained hip flexion, and we looked at that as a physical exam maneuver to see if it was sensitive to detecting disc pain, and that maneuver kind of stems from this concept here, this is data from Alf Nockhamson's paper where he measured interdiscal pressure from the L34 disc. And on the right-hand side, the highest interdiscal pressure was observed in a patient was sitting, leaning forward with bearing weight through the upper limbs. And that might remind some of us uh, uh, of some of our patients who have sedentary work uh, duties as what they're doing throughout the bulk of their awake day. So this is sustained hip flexion here. This is a snapshot. The way the maneuver is performed is the patient is prone, knees extended, uh, hips flexed. They hold their legs in this position and then they slowly lower their legs back towards the table. And a positive maneuver is one in which there's exacerbation of the index low back pain at the top of the maneuver that gradually worsens as the legs are lowered back towards the plinth. So when we take a look at three variables, age, location of back pain and, and, and back pain during the sustained inflection maneuver, and we ran that data through a, uh, a, a, a multi-regression logistic a statistical model. We found that patients who were under the age of 55 who had midline low back pain that was provoked by the sustained hip flexion maneuver, those patients had upwards or over 90% probability of a painful disc. So while we might feel more strongly that the patient has a painful disc in that scenario, the question is, how do we determine which disc it is? And that's an important question to now start to consider as we 
look at uh, the fact that we have target-specific treatment options for a painful disc. So back to this case here, this patient presented with this MRI, this is the same patient post discography CT scan on the right. The red box is drawing attention to the L4-5 disc, in which case there was a, uh, uh, a left posterior lateral annular tear that produced concordant low back pain at a low pressure. The adjacent levels were negative control levels. So discography may have a stronger uh, or a more solid place in our um, evaluation of patients who might be candidates for intradiscal regenerative uh, technologies. So to wrap up, discogenic low back pain probability increases in younger patients. Conversely, older patients more likely have painful joints. Sustained inflection appears to be more positive or positive more commonly in discogenic low back pain patients. And the presence of midline low back pain reduces the likelihood the patient has joint pain. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Mike, we want you to stay on with us for a second. We have a question for you. Right. Uh, so, so the question I have for you, and then I think Dawood has a follow-up question, then we'll get to Dr. Hunt here. Uh, the question really is, you know, 10 years ago, I did discography almost every day. My orthopedic surgeons wanted discography done on every patient almost before surgery. Now, we rarely do discography in most practices because it's not requested or not paid for. Still yet, it's an important tool. So I, my question for you is, uh, what's the reliability of discography? Uh, since it might be really instrumental to get to the other therapies we're gonna talk about the rest of this uh, program. Yeah, Tim, you had an excellent question. So, and I think your question kind of gets at the false positive rate, and that that's one reason this is a contentious topic. but. If you adhere to very stringent operational criteria, negative adjacent control, low pressure, um, uh, and, and identifying outer annular disruption, the false positive rate has been published to be less than 10% consistently. A lot of folks would say that's an acceptably low false positive rate for a clinical test. So, but again, that, that's when it's performed using very strict criteria. Um, I would all let you. I have another comment about the deleterious effects which have been suggested in literature, and that's another uh, reason to be to use it judiciously. I had to kind of shift a little bit. You know, over the last year or two, uh, with the advent of basovertebral nerve ablation, there's been another term that's come into vogue and and kind of moving away from discogenic back pain. You've heard this term thrown out as vertebrogenic back pain, where the end plate is really the source of the pain. Um, what are your thoughts on, on this kind of paradigm? Is this just something we're trying to find uh, a diagnosis for a procedure, or is there some merit to uh, potentially vertebrogenic versus discogenic? How do you kind of, are these two separate entities, or is this one and the same? I, I think they are separate entities, um, and there, there's actually a manuscript under development that speaks towards a possible fourth source of back pain. So SI joint, the set joint disc, and then implate. The implate is innervated. Uh, modic changes do correlate with painful disc levels. Um, there's outcome data with basic vertebral RF, A, that um, uh, those levels with modic changes do respond to that treatment intervention. So we have circumstantial, growing circumstantial evidence that implates can become painful. Uh, but we don't have a, validated diagnostic tool yet to make that diagnosis. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. That was uh, great. We would greatly appreciate you. Thank you, gentlemen. So our next uh, speaker is uh, one of my great friends uh, who did fellowship with me back in 2010 and 11, Dr. Corey Hunter. He's going to talk about um, FDA studies to date and give us a review of kind of the current la landscape. Corey, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dawood. Um, I've been doing uh, research on regenerative medicine for pretty much the better part of the last 25 years. And I can tell you that space has changed a lot. Um, the other thing that, you know, the people that have, uh, you know, the real, you know, giants in the field are the people that I'm really proud to share this uh, uh, this program with. Uh, you know, Doug Beal and Mike De Palma um, are guys that um, I had read everything that they'd ever published before I'd even met them. And it's always kind of cool to be in a room with them because you know they're always the smartest guys in the room when it comes to this. And then, you know, Tim Davis and uh, Kaz Emmer Delfan are just really close friends of mine. And these are guys that have really done a lot for the um, the field as far as like, you know, just pushing it forward and doing the research and bringing it to, um, you know, bringing it to clinical practice. So it's, 
really this is a field that I think Tim um, brushed on, you know, that this is how do you differentiate yourself from the people that are doing this and just claiming that they're an expert at it versus people that are um, really putting in the work. So um, I think I'm just going to kind of go over um, the evolution of the, uh, the space and bring it to current. And then, um, you know, as far as like the evidence for some of the newer clinical trials, um, Doug and uh, Kaz are going to go over. Where I started my research was on embryonic stem cells. And this is what, where the space really began. The um, research that I had done was mostly on uh, Parkinson's, movement disorders, paralysis, and pain before I ever even knew I wanted it to go into pain. And then looking at the field now, it's really changed. We've moved completely away from embryonic stem cells and we move towards uh, other types because embryonic stem cells, they're really, they're very fragile cells and they tend to not want to become what you want them to become. So when we were doing it for paralysis, they would almost never become neurons and they would just be, you know, become scar tissue. And if they became neurons, they wouldn't make useful connections. This isn't as much of a problem with um, when we're looking at connective tissue and in the, this, the case of the disc, but it's really still getting to like cajole them into becoming what you want them to become. But again, it comes down to what is the evidence. So I'm going to kind of go through a lot of these different uh, modalities. When it comes to intradiscal therapy, it's really been no secret that this is something that's been the white whale. Um, we've been able to innovate just about everything else except for um, the intradiscal space, and this is something that's really kind of eluded us. Um, when it comes to regenerative medicine, again, this is a, a field that's been, you know, really, at, um, there's been no shortage of, uh, you know, charlatans in the field. Um, people have done everything from sticking stem cells into people's eyes, claiming that they can fix uh, cataracts and they can fix people's uh, um, vision without having to get LASIK eye surgery um, to just doing all kinds of really terrible things. So that it, what it does is the legitimate stem cell research, like those of us that are on this webinar tonight, it kind of, um, it blurs the line. So how do you know what's legitimate and, you know, what's the stuff that you're just finding in the headlines? So you can see that in uh, different states, these, uh, um, these stem cell clinics are getting shut down. Um, the FDA now is kind of following suit with Canada um, and they're shutting down all the illegitimate practices. So again, when people hear stem cell research, they're, they don't know what we're talking about. They know if we're talking about the legitimate stuff or the stuff that um, is just the things you're finding in the newspaper. It even went so far as for Google to start um, banning people from advertising. So you, um, wherever you're uh, watching us from, I'm sure you've found, come across in your local newspaper, you'll see a chiropractor that'll be advertising for stem cells. And it's hard because you're trying to run a legitimate practice and then people are delegitimizing uh, some of the legitimate treatments. So going into the history of uh, intradiscal, it's one of the things I think people have really, the people that use it and the people have tried to adopt in their practice, they try to treat it like it's pixie dust. You just put it anywhere and it'll become anything. And those of us who have been doing research, that's definitely not the case. These cells, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, if you could put any cell from anybody's body into anywhere to become anything, these companies wouldn't be investing hundreds of millions of dollars into um, research and innovation. So there's a lot more that goes to it. And it's not so much a one size fits all therapy as you'll see uh, some of the companies that we're gonna go into like Vivex and Mesoblast and Digenics, Dysgenics have created their, these own like committed stem cell lines where you put them in and the body um, accepts them and they know that they're gonna become a disc. Uh, there's another research study that um, Tim Davis and I are on uh, for a company called Tissue Gene where they've developed uh, juvenile chondrocytes well, these are cells that um, are already kind of pre-committed to becoming uh, cartilage. So when you put them in the knee, they already know what to become. So it's a very different mindset than just putting in stem cells and letting them just do the rest of the work. And where it becomes even more interesting is in the space now, you know, we're very used as pain physicians to just off the shelf remedies. So when we do an epidural, we take the steroids off the shelf and we inject it. So with stem cell therapy and things as so far as like PRP, it's, you know, it's kind of a disconnect for us because now we're having to take tissue and we're having to culture it. But if we were able to kind of make it what we're used to, where we could have um, a stem cell therapy or regenerative therapy or whatever it is, and something we can just order, something that we can buy, and then we can inject into the patient, that's really, um, I think that's what people are looking for. Um, something that's perhaps maybe uh, seen in the eyes of the FDA as a drug. And that's what we're going to be going into. But that's where the field is definitely going to be evolving to. Uh, next. Okay, there we go. Let me go back one. I'm sorry, it's jumping around. So looking at some of the previous attempts, you can see that uh, stem cell ther or intradiscal therapy has really had no shortage of uh, comers to the field. Um, on the left-hand side, you'll see all of the uh, injectable drugs, everything from the ozone, methylene blue, 
vibrant sealants and then you know one of the newer more current ones is prp and then on the right a lot of the things that have come and gone idat um, people like it i liked it um, bicuplasty nucleoplasty these are things that have all come but they've never really stood the test of time so while there's been an over an abundance of therapies in the space none have really stayed so it still is um there's room for improvement and that's where these therapies come into play so as far as going into the intradiscals, we'll start with one uh, that some people may remember, fibrin. So fibrin is the therapy that we, uh, we use in surgery um, to promote clotting and healing. And a very uh, smart gentleman had figured out the idea, maybe we could stick it inside the disc and we could promote healing in there. So the advantages are, again, this is a pre-packaged um, pre biologic, um, easy to use. It's basically just getting an um, you know, intradiscal approach like a discogram and you inject it. The disadvantages are the evidence. So it wasn't regulated by the FDA and the clinical trial didn't have good results. Now, it wasn't because the study was poorly designed, not necessarily. Um, it was the control was saline. And uh, I think as Doug is gonna go into, saline actually is a therapeutic agent. So it kind of hamstring the study. So when you look at the evidence, this is where it lies. There are people that still use it, but it's about on the le um, level of level two, two evidence. And if you could, there we go. So when you looked at it, so the uh, the company that created it was Biostat, and against they compared it against saline, and um, they basically stopped the study short at six months because it failed to um, failed to show there was a statistically significant difference as compared to saline. Um, and again, saline is an effective treatment, unfortunately. Uh, going into uh, bone morphogenic proteins, um, this is another one that kind of came and went. Um, Again, it was, it was a small study. Um, it never got published uh, because they, uh, the study designers decided to put uh, MRI as one of the uh, one of the endpoints, and it failed to meet the primary endpoint. So they discontinued the study. Uh, growth differentiation factor, or GDF five, uh, was a phase three study, double blind randomized control, 150 patients at 15 sites. They stopped it at six months uh, due to lack of efficacy, and the study wasn't published. So these were things that were the precursors over the last 10 to 15 years that all stopped short. Now coming current, PRP. So PRP is something that's been around for about 25 years. It was originally discovered um, for things that were not disc related. Um, it was used very uh, prominently in the OMFS space for uh, jaw surgery. Um, University of Miami was one of the first places to bring it to the United States. And people started to remember uh, the Kobe procedure and the Dirk Nowitzki procedure. Um, and this is something that people have tried to adapt now to the um, to the intradiscal space. The advantages are obvious. It's easy to get. Um, there's no real risk of infection, uh, no real risk of uh, rejection. What the disadvantages are um, that there is a higher risk for infection when you put in a spine because blood is a natural uh, culturing agent. And there have been a few studies for it. There was one at a hospital for special surgery, and it, they showed they discontinued the study, I think, and then redid it but there's a really high potential for discitis as high as 25%, and discitis is a potentially devastating complication. When you look at the evidence for it um, in intradiscal spine, it's very low. So these are the proteins and the growth factors that are present, but what remains to be seen are these are the ones that are actually needed to promote disc healing um, or regrowth. And this is where the evidence lies, it's all the way at the bottom, but it is better for other things. There are things that it's fantastic for that have level one evidence like tennis elbow, OA of the hips and knees, um, and shoulder pain. When you look at some of the studies that are out there, uh, one of the last was a meta-analysis uh, uh, published by Mancha Conti, which showed that there was actually statistically significant difference um, in the spine when you did it um, at six months and after one year. But again, this is something that's been a little bit inconsistent. It's unregulated, um, and there is a high incidence of, uh, of discitis, so it's not something that's really kind of uh, taken off. And when you look at some of the other um, some of the other variants, one of them is alpha 2 microglobulin that uh, Gaetano Scuderi uh, came up with as basically an alternative. So alpha-2 microglobulin is contained in the platelet pore plasma, the part that we often discard. Um, in layman's terms, PRP is what does the long-term healing and PPP tend to do a little bit of the, uh, the more immediate healing. Um, some of the evidence was decent. Um, it showed to be an important treatment for degenerative disc, um, but again, this has never really taken off. So going into the future, which is what we're going to uh, spend the rest of the evening discussing, cell-based intradiscal therapies. So this is something that's kind of um, moved around a little bit. It's been a little bit of a moving target. When you look at all of the studies that are out there, um, and this was a slide that I got from Doug Beal, there's a whole lot of articles. There's over a thousand articles on the use of it, but only six ended up meeting the criteria for this review that was published in Spine in 2018. And you can actually see that um, 
basically it boils down to only about 74 patients. And when you look at the, some of the studies we're going to show you today, um, they have more than um, more than double that. So the evidence is actually quite robust to show for um, intradiscal cell therapy. So this is uh, bringing those studies together. You can see the VAST response was about 44.2 points decreased. Uh, most important thing would be the ODI, which is function, and it shows there was 32.2 um, points decreased. So these intradiscal cell therapies are actually proving to be a lot more robust and a lot more sustainable and reproducible. So the first one would be bone marrow aspirate concentrate. This is where you would just basically take your own uh, bone marrow aspirate, you spin it down, and you'll get um, essentially PRP and the bone cells. The advantages are obvious. Um, it's basically just a, uh, a step further from uh, PRP. The disadvantages are these cells, um, it varies based on age. So the older a patient gets, the less of these mesenchymal stem cells that they'll have in there. Um, and also they're not necessarily going to become intradiscal cells, or if you put them into the knee, they're not necessarily gonna become cartilage. They tend to wanna become fibroblasts. So this isn't something that we can just do. And this is where these companies and their innovation comes in because they can do transfection and they can guide these cells to become specifically what you need. So in the case of uh, the, um, companies like Mesoblast and Dysgenics and Vivex, they've already kind of tweaked these cells so that when they get into the disc, they're gonna to wanna to become a disc cell and lack of, lack of a better term for it. And this is where the evidence was for bone marrow. This is not something that's been greatly studied. Um, the evidence is coming though, people are looking at it. And then the, the variant of it is the adipose, which is kind of, I think, going a little bit by the wayside. The mesenchymal stem cells and the allografts, um, this is where the future lies for our field. This is where the evidence is heading and this is what's gonna become the future standard of care for us. So the advantages are you know, pretty obvious. These are hypoimmunogenic, these are off the shelf. These are things that will become regulated by the FDA as drugs. The disadvantages is really just that there are still in clinical trials. So as far as people have seen, these are um, efficacious, they're safe and they work. So this is where the evidence will be. They're still in clinical trials for both. Um, another one that's off topic would be tissue gene, which is another one where they're using these types of cells, but uh, chondrocytes to put into the knee. And lastly, just to go into the ongoing studies that are here. Um, these are, uh, I think most of us are um, done this on this uh, webinar or in the dysgenic study. Uh, it just completed their phase one. These are some other ones that are here. You can see basically it's either allogeneic or autologous. And then the simple differences is the vehicle that they use. HA stands for hyaluronic acid, PRP is obvious. Um, and this, the amount of stem cells um, that they're using in these kind of varies. And the outcome, outcome measures are a little, some of them are a little bit more robust than others. The ones that are currently uh, finished or finishing, I should say, would be Vivex and Mesoblast. And that's where my colleagues are gonna go into discussing both of those and the differences between them, one being allogeneic mesenchymal stem cells with HA and Vivex being a viable allograph with micronized disc. And we were on both of those studies. So with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Tim and Dawood. Corey, great job. Uh, just, a, just a quick question. I'm gonna put you on the spot a bit here as uh, I often do with you uh, because we've been friends for so long. Um, you mentioned the the kind of snake oil in the beginning, what we hear in some clinics where there's $5,000 cash pay because most insurances have covered these therapies. What would you consider uh, if you had a, your best friend wanted to have one of these therapies? Uh, just based a very quick answer based on the evidence. What is out there that's a terrible idea and what's out there that has most promise? The ones that have the most promise, I would say, would be the ones that we're going to present today, the uh, the Vivexes of the world, the dysgenics and the mesoblasts. These are the ones that we've seen that they've put a lot of uh, energy into the science. If you talk to the people from, uh, you know, Vivex, they've really perfected this, um, you know, this creation. And if you look at the Vivex study, it was really, um, you know, what you're going to see when Doug presents it is that this is done on a real type of patient where you can see that there's results on two levels um, instead of just, you know, one level disc. The things to avoid, I would be, you know, the things where there just is no evidence, where no one ever really tried to do it. With PRP, no one's tried to really push the evidence forward. Um, there's a high risk of in infection. And, you know, there's studies have shown that if just putting a needle into a disc causes, it's more likely to make it uh, herniate later on in time. So it's not like it's without its risk to just do it and worst case, worst case scenario, it fails. If you go in there, you want to make sure that it works. Very good. Corey, I kind of wanted to pick your brain on another area of your expertise. I know in, in addition to regenerative medicine, you're an expert in coding and reimbursement with your work you do with CPT. What do you think is going to be, uh, you know, if you're sitting on the CPT panel, what's going to be the evidence that, you know, these companies really need to show? What's the burden? What kind of studies are you going to need to see to really support 
um, these things, you know, getting codes and getting FDA approval and getting, you know, ultimately getting reimbursement. That's a great question because, um, you know, as we know that uh, one of the companies right now is applying for a Category 3 code, um, which for anybody who's listening, a Category 3 code is the precursor to a Category 1, which is where the uh, the uh, CMS and AMA is giving them a code to basically trial and see what you do, and it's a test run, and if you meet the criteria, we'll give you a full-fledged code, which um, CMS will pay for. I think what uh, people want to see is um, not just evidence, but legitimate evidence. You're not cherry picking the patients. You're not coming up with this ridiculous uh, inclusion exclusion criteria, which basically excludes 95% of the average Americans. They want to see a real study that's going to select the average American and put them in there. And I think most importantly, they're going to want to see that it's going to save uh, the healthcare system money and it's going to be a good alternative and a less expensive alternative to an expensive surgery. Uh, that's, great. A, that's, a great, that's a great answer, Corey, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, with that, thank you so much. Uh, Dalwood, our next speaker. Yes, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Timothy Davis, pain management physician to the stars in Hollywood and uh, Southern California. He's really been a trailblazer uh, when it comes to uh, the area of regenerative medicine with his work on uh, many of the landmark studies. Uh, he's going to talk to us about what we really need to be cautious about and talk about uh, what are some potential complications uh, with uh, biologics and intradiscal therapies. Tim, take it. Yeah, thanks. I'd like to thank uh, Tim and Dawood and Aspen for putting this on. Uh, I think we have some great information tonight that uh, we need to get out there because this is just the beginning of, of this space, uh, the rebirth of this space. And so as Mike had mentioned, uh, me and, and him and, and many others on this panel have been doing these interdiscal studies for the past 14 years. And, and it's kind of scary when you start out in, in an area like this and you don't really have a whole lot of uh, support around. Uh, you don't have a whole lot of experience of other people around to tell you whether something's normal or not. And so uh, I'll start just by saying with any of these intradiscal studies, um, one of the first things you end up getting is you end up getting pain with injection. And so when we were first starting to do these, uh, just like you would with discography, it's a provocative study, but even when you're putting small amounts of volume in, you can cause stimulation of that annulus and you can cause pain. So when we start doing intradiscal biologics, uh, less than one cc is usually not going to generate that much pressure and usually not going to generate much pain. When you start getting one cc and above, uh, depending on the viscosity of what you're injecting, you can start to irritate that annulus. So you will get some immediate type of post-procedure pain. Uh, it stimulates the annulus, pressurizes the end plates, and usually causes spasm because the body's trying to immobilize that injured area. So what we usually will do is we'll pre-medicate with uh, muscle relaxant right before the procedure, and then we'll um, uh, give them some pain medication like an opiate analgesic and a muscle relaxant thereafter. We usually try to stay away from any anti-inflammatories, obviously, because uh, these biologics are sometimes a pro-inflammatory type of process, and then give them a lumbar corset. Now, the secondary pain, these are the things that I'm really going to go into. Infection and what, what we kind of term a biologic flare. We don't know what else to call it. Um, infection the disc space is, is avascular. And so if something gets in there, it can start brewing and it can actually take a little longer than what you would, what you would normally see. Uh, somebody there, hold on. Is that gonna advance? There we go. Uh, I'm just gonna go through a few of the things we've run into. So back in 2009, we were doing the OP1 study as BMP7, a 44 year old male with a 10 to 15 year history of low back pain. Uh, we injected the L4-5 disc about seven weeks post-injection. He started to have an increased uh, low back pain. Now, when you're in the studies, there's certain visits that are protocol. There's certain MRIs that are protocol. Uh, but when people have increased pain that's unexpected, you got to bring them in. So it's an, it's an adverse event, and you have to figure out what's going on. So it's an unscheduled visit. Uh, at that time, uh, the MRI showed just a little bit of inflated edema. Now, it wasn't enough to really be concerned about. But we went ahead and did uh, labs and, uh, you know, uh, blood cultures and everything was negative. Um, but it, it ended up resolving after 24 weeks, but after quite a few sleepless nights. Uh, and I actually biopsied the disc because it looked like this. Uh, the initial MRI had just a little bit of end plate edema. This was a few weeks later when the edema had gone well up into the superior and inferior end plate. 
And now the CT even gets more impressive. Do you see the erosions there? It goes through the, the um, most, the thinnest part of the end plate where the nutrients come through. That's where the OP1 goes in. Now, anybody that knows BMP or OP1, um, well, OP1 was the trade was the trade brand. BMP, it's bone morphogenic protein. Uh, what it does is it causes osteolysis first, then it causes osteoblast activity second. And so it's found usually when you have a long bone fracture, it's circulating around naturally to try to clean up the ends of the bone. Then the osteoblast activity comes back in and starts to heal and form callus. So this, there was no puncture of the end plate or anything, but this absorbed through both end plates and started to erode into the uh, vertebral body. Uh, this is an axial view, and so from the MRI, you can see this big kind of fluid signal on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, you can see this bullet hole right through the end plate. Uh, that completely resolved, and it's hard to believe, but as I said before, there were a lot of sleepless nights. Uh, the lab values were completely negative. The biopsy of the disc was completely negative. Uh, we never gave him any antibiotics or anything. And as soon as it came, it went, uh, self-resolving. Uh, in 2010, we started doing some fibrin sealant, and this was in preparation to do the biostat study. We wanted to give it a try and see if we, we thought it worked. So this is a 56-year-old female with six-year history of low back pain, and she had L3, 4, L4, 5 disc degeneration with uh, positive discograms, and so put in fibrin sealant. About two weeks later, she started to have severe increase in low back pain, and she was admitted to the hospital through the emergency department, and there was some mild in edema at L3, 4. Labs were negative, but I went ahead, uh, they got the pain under control, discharged her, and I went ahead and biopsied the disc, and we got a positive culture. Uh, so she got six weeks of IV antibiotics, and the infection resolved, and the back pain resolved actually below baseline. Uh, so this is one of those things, when I look back on it, why did it happen? Well, one of the reasons it happened was part of the protocol for the uh, Biostat study, which we were going to follow, was using a single 18-gauge uh, needle through the skin, not using a two-needle technique. So anybody that's done a lot of discograms, the two-needle technique was developed to try to keep the tip of the second needle from ever touching the epidermis or the dermis or passing through that layer. So you go ahead and you make your initial uh, insertion through the epidermis and dermis with the first needle, then you pass the second needle through. Well, this one was done by going directly through the epidermis and the dermis. Sorry about that. So this, uh, that was her scan. So uh, had some Smorl's nodes that ended up developing and then had these modic changes right here. And these were the discs that were treated. Uh, she was only infected at the 3-4 level, not at the 4-5 level. So in 2011, this was from the Biostat study. So this was basically fibrin sealant. Um, and this was a 23-year-old male with a five-year history of back pain. We did an L5-S1 biostat injection. Two weeks post-procedure, he was actually feeling better, which was a surprise to any of us because we'd already had experience with uh, OP1 and with GDF5 by that time. And then I had also done quite a few off-label fiber and sealants by that time, and really nobody gets better in two weeks. Everybody's usually still kind of hurting from the disc pressurization. He started feeling better, but 16 weeks so four months later, he started to have severe increase in his low back pain and decreased range of motion spasm. We got an MRI and he had in plate edema at L5S1. Labs were negative and we biopsied and culture was negative. CT showed erosion of the L5S1 in plates and MRI showed massive edema through the vertebral bodies. By eight months, uh, the MRI had improved and by 10 and a half months, the pain had reduced below baseline. So he actually ended up getting better, but it was a very long drawn out process. And this is kind of the second example of what we had termed the biologic flare. The first one was in the, the, the OP1 study where you saw all that osteolysis into the bone. That's exactly what BMP does. So it produces this big biologic reaction into the vertebral bodies. And that's the same exact thing that happened with this, and this was just fibrin sealant. So when you look back at the original data of why they even started to try to do fibrin sealant and what they were doing in the pig models, they actually saw an increase in TGF beta when they biopsied the discs that were in the pigs. 
So there was some increase in growth factor that was coming after these injections. And we have to assume that this must have been the cause of why this flare reaction happened. But you can see it looks very eerily similar where at the end plate, you have this bullet hole formation at inferior L5 and superior S1. And then here's the erosions in the end plate at, on the CT. Now, I don't show these pictures to everyone to try to scare them. I show, I show everyone to try to pass on some wisdom. It took a lot of years uh, and a lot of studies to even see these things happen. So it's not like these are tremendously prevalent, but they can happen. And when you see them, you have to be aware they can be infectious, but they could also be just a natural process of this biologic flare reaction occurring. And so this one completely resolved as well uh, after 10 and a half months. Now he, however, did end up having some residual modic changes where the first one had zero modic changes. Those, the, the post CT filled in to where all that osteolysis was gone. Uh, this one, however, modic changes remain. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Smorel's nodes remain, not modic changes. In 2012, this was on the, uh, one of the other studies, the uh, allogeneic stem cell study, a uh, 19-year-old with two-year history of back pain, L5-S1 injection. About four weeks post-procedure, he started to have severe increase in low back pain, decreased range of motion, spasm. MRI showed really some mild in-plate edema. Labs were negative. We kind of sat on it because we'd had this history of these biologic flares we'd seen before. So we made the assumption that this might be what was going on with him but we kept a close eye on it. Well, six weeks later, we got another MRI because his pain wasn't getting better. The MRI showed increased in-plate edema with evolution of a Schmorl's node. His labs finally popped positive. He had an increased ESR, ESR, CRP, and white count. And then we biopsied the disc and it was positive. Uh, so the lesson there was we did use some historical knowledge to not act too soon, but to keep really close watch on this and see what happened and see how it evolved. Uh, in, in any of the flare reactions that we've seen, we never saw an ESR that was elevated or a C-reactive protein or a white blood count that was elevated. And anytime we biopsy the disc, it was negative. So those markers, the SED rate, the CRP, and the white blood cell count can be the prodrome. They can start to show you that this is turning infectious. Uh, so 25 weeks post-op, he had resolution of symptoms, but it was only after six weeks of IV antibiotics. Uh, then this is a, a discogram of a 40-year-old female, 3-4 discogram, two-needle technique, uh, increased pain 24 hours later. Now, what I said in the very beginning is, you know, you can pressurize these discs, and that pressurization can kind of increase over a period of time that we've seen with the biologics. This was just with a discogram. Uh, but about two weeks later, the MRI started to show some increased inflated edema, and uh, also two weeks later, there was CT uh, evidence of erosion. Labs turned positive and then biopsy positive. And six weeks later, she ended up with uh, um, IND and a lumbar fusion. So this is what that looked like on MRI. You can see the modic changes on the left-hand side, uh, T2 image and then T1 image, they show up as black and dark. And then uh, here's a little bit different weighting, a flare uh, and, and I'm sorry, stir. And then post GAD on the right hand side really shows it illuminating. And then once again, eerily similar with the erosion into the end plates. Uh, you can see this type of reaction with infectious and non infectious uh, biologic reaction. So this was a 44-year-old with allogeneic stem cells, a two-year history of low back pain. Uh, this is a skip level. So this individual got an L1, 2, and L4, 5. Initial pain after about two months of after injection started to increase. And uh, then MRI showed in-plate edema with evolution of Schmorl's nodes. And this is another example of basically uh, a biologic flare, this, this result. Uh, I think one of the take-homes is anytime you see something like this, you have to immediately think, is there a possibility of infection or is this just a biologic flare reaction that we're dealing with? And do your lab work up, 
keep an eye on the MRIs, know that it's a possibility, but it's a low probability. Uh, now, in my practice, uh, I, I, you know, when we were doing a lot of discograms, I've, I've done over 5,000 levels of discograms, and I've not had uh, an infection, knock on wood. Uh, with OP1, we did 17 people in our site. We had one person, and at eight weeks, we saw the flare reaction. Now, that was the one person out of 100 and what 60 people that we did that were that were enrolled in that study and and it was self resolving all the labs were negative biopsy was negative uh, we just waited and watched and then it resolved at 24 weeks now his pain never got back you know never got really better it just kind of went back down to baseline gdf5 we enrolled 15 didn't see anything like this and i think there was 150 or 160 people nationwide uh, and we never saw any of these types of reactions, but it was halted uh, prematurely. So who knows what we might have seen. Uh, to seal, I did um, 56. Actually, I kept count of those. And I had one discitis that showed up at about six weeks, uh, but resolved by 16 weeks after antibiotics. Biostat, we did 21 of them. Uh, I think we enrolled about 200 nationwide. I can't remember. I think Corey had that number up. But at about 16 weeks is when we saw this flare reaction. Biopsy was negative, labs was negative, uh, in the, the MRI looked awful. And, uh, you know, if you got this into the wrong person's hands, that person would end up on the operating table with an IND infusion very quickly. But that was a wait and watch, and it resolved by 43 weeks, which was a really long time to wait and watch. Uh, then MSCs, we enrolled 15. Discitis showed up at four weeks. Positive cultures, positive lab work antibiotics for six weeks. He never ended up having a surgery. It was all resolved by 25 weeks. Uh, bone marrow aspirate concentrate, done 200 plus of those without an infection. PRP, only have done a little over 50 of those uh, with no infection. Um, and then via disc, we did uh, 27 in that study and we didn't have any complications. But everybody has that increased back pain from pressurization immediately. Now, the other two things I showed you was an MSC, uh, you know, was a stem cell flare reaction that came on at about six weeks with negative labs. Uh, there was no biopsy. And that one of the reasons was because this wasn't my, my uh, client, but one of the reasons that there was not a biopsy done on this individual was because we've had all this history and all this wisdom from these other studies that this could have been a biologic flare and it did turn out to be one. And then uh, the discogram, um, uh, the discitis that I showed you, that was not mine, but uh, it showed you that within 24 hours, this person started having pain. But then about two weeks later, that's when the discitis really started to uh, show itself. So in summary, you're going to get an increased pain with uh, immediate injection due to pressurization. You can pre-medicate with muscle relaxant, uh, lumbar corset, and then some analgesic pain medication. Discitis can happen. It's about one to four percent after discograms, so this is going to be a very similar kind of setup. The disc is in a vascular space, so it may take a little longer for this thing to declare itself, and it turns into its own little abscess. It's got its own container there. Uh, IV antibiotics, uh, doing a biopsy, doing a disc lavage with Vanco and Gent, uh, which is I've done that in the past. Uh, but work it up. Uh, you want to see the MRI. You want to check for any blood work, CBC, CRP, ESR. Uh, think about starting IV antibiotics, if any of those pop positive, and then potentially doing a, a lavage of the disc. And if it's aseptic, you watch and wait. Wow, Tim, I think you scared me to death just now, but uh, it's very <laughs> I, did, I did not intend to, like, uh, you guys. I really have done, really, you know, I, I've, been, I've, done thousands, uh, I've done thousands of levels of discograms over the years and haven't had one of those problems, so I was really fortunate. But the question for you, and just one quick question for you, you know, when we do any type of intrathecal drug study, we have great animal models and they're safe. Then we have initial first use in human and they're safe. Uh, what's the scrutiny level of the things you just talked about with uh, animal and human studies before they get to uh, more widespread use? Has there been enough scrutiny the of these things? Yeah, it, it's, look, it's the same. The, the animal studies have been done. Um, you know, a lot of times it's, they're looking for disc hydration changes, things of that nature. I can't tell you how many animal studies I've seen that show disc hydration show in the rat tail. But let me tell you something, it doesn't translate to an MRI in a, in a clinical you know, human trial. But the, the risk of infectious process is there. It's extraordinarily low. 
but we do encounter it. Uh, I think the reason that the disk space is just this, this area that everybody kind of tiptoes around is because it is avascular. And if, if an infection starts to brew in there, it can kind of, it can gain some momentum before it really declares itself. And so I think that when you're doing interdiscal studies, when you're doing interdiscal work, you just really need to be aware of this. I certainly did not mean to scare anybody too badly with this presentation, but this is, you know, this is uh, 15 years of doing these studies, throwing all right. kinds of stuff into the disk space. No, no, I think, uh, and, and again, thank you so much for that talk. I, I think you did the right level of, of discussion. I don't think you really, you know, I was just, just giving you a, a little bit of a hard time. I think you did, did the right level of discussion. It's very serious, but important and rare, thankfully. And you discussed the, the possibility of what we need to look for. So thank you so much. That was a very valuable talk. I think it sets the tone for the, the last half hour of the program. Dawood? Yeah, it's my great honor to uh, introduce our next next speaker, uh, another great friend of mine, Dr. Kaz Amard Delphin. He's going to be jumping into some of the data here. So we're going to be talking about uh, the single-blinded randomized control uh, trial that was done on allogenic mesenchymal precursor cells. Kaz? Thank you, Delwood. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak amongst the giants in this field. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of the studies that I've done here at this uh, at, at our facility, IPM Medical Group in Northern California. But uh, just about everybody else who's on this uh, particular uh, webinar was involved in this study as well. This is a single blind uh, randomized controlled trial evaluating the safety and efficacy of allogeneic mesenchymal precursor cells uh, in single level lumbar disc disease uh, with patients that did not have radiculopathy. So as a background, this was a mesoblast sponsored study. The mesoblast is a company in Australia. The, the study had 11 sites, 10 sites were here in the United States and one site in Australia. They have developed a proprietary method that they can take um, stem cells uh, from a, a bone marrow uh, of a healthy donor and put it through a proprietary process to make it allogeneic and then put it into a, a master cell bank and expand it in order for us to be able to use it in the patients. They did quite a few animal studies first before we went to the safety and efficacy phase two study. Um, Next slide, please. So ideally, we'd love to be able to treat the patients and get the greater than minimal clinically important difference in our patient population for at least 12, 12 to 24 months without having to do any type of surgery or injections on the patients. We would love to get about 50% reduction in the patient's back pain and about a 15 point improvement in their ODI scores. And if, they, if we can achieve all of those with any type of injection that we do inside the disc, then we effectively won this game. Next slide. So in this particular study, we had 100 patients in a randomized controlled manner. There was, it was single blinded, meaning that only the patient was blinded. We followed these patients for about 36 months. The primary endpoint was obviously safety because it was a phase two study. But the secondary endpoints included efficacy, VAS scores, ODI, and MRIs, as well as flexion and extension series um, of the patient's lumbar spines. Uh, we, uh, these patients had a modified permanent score of somewhere between three to six. That means they had mild to moderate disc disease, and they did, could not have had radiculopathy to be in the study. They also could not have anything beyond type one or type two modic changes in their end plates. Um, the flow chart for the, and obviously they needed to have an intact annulus or an incomplete annular tear for obvious reasons. These patients have discography. If the contrast leaked out, that would mean that they have an annular tear and they potentially could not contain the stem cells inside the, the nucleus itself. The flow chart was fairly simple. All the patients who were enrolled in the study was about 100. 40 of them got, uh, uh, um, went into the, uh, placebo branch or the control branch, 20 patients were the placebo or saline. Corey Hunter talked about how uh, saline is not placebo and you'll see in just a couple of minutes how saline patients actually did respond quite a bit as well. Hyaluronic acid was the vehicle we used to actually inject the uh, MPCs into the disc itself and that was our control. On the active arm of the study on the right side, we had uh, a 6 million cell arm and an 18 million cell arm. And the reason we did this was because we wanted to see if there was any difference in efficacy with the quantity of cells utilized. Next slide. So 
before I show you the uh, results, we need to define these things. The MCID or minimal clinically, clinically important difference was 30% reduction in the patient's VAS score, no post-treatment intervention such as injections or surgery, and at least a 10-point reduction in their ODI scores. The clinically significant change was at least 50% of reduction in the VAS score and no post-treatment injections or surgery, and at least a 15-point uh, uh, improvement in their ODI scores. So. On, this is a very busy slide, but if you look at the left side first, this is the MIC side. You can see the, the black vertical line is saline. The gray vertical line is hyaluronic acid. Light blue is 6 million cells, and dark blue is 18 million cells. As you can see, every single arm of the study responded at least 30% pain control in the patients. Looking at the right side, which is the stuff that we care about as clinicians, the clinically significant pain responders, you could see how the 6 million stem cells um, arm of the study did far better through 24 months, and things started to stabilize and fall apart by about 36 months. So the theory behind this is that we could potentially stabilize these patients with a single injection inside their disc as long as the patient selection criteria has been met. But beyond 24 months, we may not have as good of an um, outcome. Minimal pain responders were also measured. These are patients who had a vascular of 2.0 or less. As you can see, again, saline and hyaluronic acid both had a responder rate in this group as well, but the 6 million MPC cells did far better than 18 million MPC cells, but the active group as a group did better than the control group altogether. Next slide. We also measured their ODI responses. Again, if uh, MIC was uh, 10 points or less ODI improvement, you can see that even the saline and the hyaluronic acid had responders in this group on the left side. And um, uh, with the 6 million and 18 million cells, we had a far better response rate with the ODI scores. Looking at the clinically significant change, which was 15 points or more improvement in the patient's ODI scores, the uh, NPC group did far better and somewhat uh, equal between the 18 million cell and the 6 million cell group. Next slide. The composite adds all of this data together and it presents it. The left side of this uh, table shows the MIC group has a composite that includes no interventions, uh, a VASCO reduction, uh, improvement in the ODI scores at least, at least 10 points. And you can see how the active group with the MPCs, 6 and 18 million cells both did quite better than the control group, but again, there was a response with saline and uh, hyaluronic acid both. With the clinically significant group, the improvement was far better in the uh, MPC group than it was with the saline group or the hyaluronic acid group. Um, next slide, please. So in conclusion, we really saw that this is in fact a very safe product to use. We did not see any significant adverse events. There was one single uh, discitis, and that was a technical issue with the injection itself. Outside of that, uh, we uh, did blood tests on these patients in a serial manner. We also um, got uh, serial MRIs and x-rays on these patients, and there was no safety issues at all. And the patients who got MPCs had improvement uh, through 24 months and you know, in, into 36, well into 36 months. The next steps is to, for us to do a larger uh, phase three uh, double-blinded randomized control trial, and that's a study that we just completed and the data is being analyzed as we speak. So Kaz, great job as always. Let me ask you a question. Thank so you. Uh, your mother comes to the clinic with discogenic disease. Uh, she's been recommended for surgery by her orthos fine surgeon, and you have this product available through the FDA. What would you tell yes. her her odds are that she would do well uh, with this type of therapy versus surgery? Okay, so my mother is 85 years old. So I would say that uh, her odds are not so good because I would suspect that she has so much progressive disease that her Furman score is far beyond the three to six that we study in this particular study. But if my mother was 45 or 50 years old and she had moderate disc disease, then this could potentially be um, a potential um, um, a treatment uh, option for her that she could try before she tries surgery. And you'll see Doug Beal is about to present another study that we have all been involved in with Biodisc, and the results are even better than what we saw in the mesoblast study. And not surprisingly, you uh, you took it where I, I love to see you take it, and that is you looked at the group that you actually studied and gave us the outcome data. So that's where I was hoping you would go with that. So thank you so much. That was thank a you. wonderful presentation. How about our next speaker? Awesome job, Cass. Thank you. Uh, so, 
I really like the way this uh, kind of webinar is going. It's kind of evolving as we go, and now we're kind of going to the next step in the data and the evidence. So, Dr. Uh, Doug Beal, my my brother from Tornado Alley down in Oklahoma, uh, is going to present some really compelling data uh, that's really kind of perked my interest in this whole field. Uh, Interdisciplinary biologics, twelve month data presentation. Doug, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Doug. It's a real pleasure to be with you guys tonight. Thanks to Aspen Tim and our great uh, moderators for putting this on. This is a very exciting time for me. I, tonight, I will present to you uh, the results of the VAST trial. And the VAST trial is a large triple arm randomized control trial. And this is data from this randomized control trial enrolling patients with discogenic back pain. And so this includes patients with discogenic back pain that is the Fairman grades three through six. So this is moderately degenerated, not normal, not the kind of discogenic back pain that would give rise to uh, vertebrogenic pain that was mentioned earlier. So without uh, further pomp and circumstance, let's jump right into it. So this is uh, in 215 patients, this is visual analog scale improvements uh, between 35 and 45 points for the active allograft seeing the line that I perceive as purple, and then the crossover to active treatment and the green dash and dotted line. And the placebo, and the placebo is in air quotes, and that was used as saline as on your left. And the reason why a lot of us are really excited about this uh, stems from the data the court presented earlier, and this is the Wu meta analysis that said, on the average, if you take the six trials with a grand total of 74 patients, the the improvement in VAS was a fairly profound 44.2. I mean, that's as good as many things that we will test. And we have almost an identical improvement in Oswestry Disability Index of 27 to 36 points, keeping in mind that one category is 20 points. This is almost a category and a half. And we see the three placebo, active allograft, and the crossover to active treatment lines paired out just the same as they were, almost identical in the VAS trial, and we can compare that with the Wu meta-analysis of 32 points. And so this compares not only favorably, but very favorably. So one of the issues that was discussed previously by Corey is one versus two levels. So all of the trials that have been mentioned, all of them except for one, and that's the Biostat trial, used one level. And I can understand the use of one level, trying to decrease the number of compounding variables, trying to get this the, the data to be very clean, trying to get it to be isolated to discogenic back pain. I understand that. But if you look at your own practice, how many single level discogenic back pain uh, patients do you have? Well, they're not rare, but they're unusual. They don't come along very often. How many patients do you have in your clinical practice that is a 4551 level discogenic back pain? Well, you can probably think of a number just off the top of your head. And so this compares two levels uh, with one level because two levels were allowed in the VAST trial. So when you look at the data in the active allograph and the crossover, not only did the two level patients do well, they actually did better than the single level patients and different from the saline patients. And they did better than the one level patients, not only in the visual analog scale reduction in back pain, but also in the Oswestry disability reduction in back pain. So this was designed at the very outset uh, by what Chief Medical Officer of Vivex, Tim Ganey, who's uh, excellent in designing trials. And we had this discussion. We wanted to make it as close to your and, and my clinical practice as possible. And I think we've accomplished this. And it turns out we got a better treatment outcome treating two levels rather than just one. So one of the marquee data that uh, Kaz just presented was the mesoblast, and that's what data got a lot of us very interested in regenerative treatment for discogenic back pain. And we see here the two high responder groups, meaning patients with no back pain is defined as less than 20 points on the VAS or less than two in the numerical rating scale. And then people with a profound reduction in back pain, meaning cut the back pain in half or more. And this was kind of the marquee data for mesoblast because 69% uh, of the, the patients with the mesoblast data had their back pain cut in half or more. And as good as that was, and as much interest as that generated in phase two, the VAS trial is very comparable to that. 
and the patients from the mesoblast that had their back pain cut in half was also comparable. And the VAST trial did not suffer by comparison of this between up to 59% and the allograft crossover got ended up with no back pain as defined by less than 20. So as we go on to the prominent responder group, what we did find is that in the responder group that, that was a high responder cohort, 91% uh, uh, in the crossover group had a greater than 20 point reduction in back pain. And this is the single point in the, the visual analog scale pain reduction that was statistically significant. So we've now seen statistically significant reduction in pain at least in this responder group, the high responder group. As compared to the Oswestry disability, we measured that the MCID was greater than 10 points. One of the FDA standards is greater than 15. And then we also measured it greater than 20 points. And so uh, we had statistically significant reductions. I have up to 10 and 15 points there. It actually turns out that all three groups were statistically significant. And with a 15 point or greater improvement in Oswestry disability, keeping in mind that 20 is a full category, we had up to 78% of patients that experienced this degree of a functional improvement as compared with the mesoblast data, that was 50%. So I'll present to you Oswestry functional improvement and then VAS improvement. And we had 53% in the active allograft and 64% improvement in the crossover to active treatment uh, with the via disc cellular allograft. We can compare that to the relevant decrease in pain of 46.7%. We also have a decrease in back pain of 54 and 50 and 65% respectively for the two groups. And keeping in mind that the Oswestry disability is 53 and 64, and this compares with the primary endpoint in the uh, basic vertebral relievant SMART trial of 41%. And one of the reasons we keep mentioning the comparison to the uh, basic vertebral SMART trial is a couple of different reasons. Number one, it's a large trial. The SMART trial is 225 patients as compared with 218 patients in the VAST trial, so very similar. The other one is vertebrogenic pain. We mentioned this earlier. Uh, vertebrogenic and discogenic, they're different patient populations. I agree completely with uh, Dr. De Palma. Is uh, on the average, discogenic pain or young, healthy people is on the average 36 years old, BMI of 27, and the basal vertebral nerve ablation will be about 53 uh, years old. So these are different patients, but they're comparable in terms of location and clinical presentation. So large trial, and it also compares with the sham. So the sham here is 32% uh, reduction in pain and just docking the needles, which is a profound one compared to data by Hoffman and Levine, they said between 10 and 20% is, is about the normal. But nevertheless, basic vertebral nerve ablation was significantly better than the sham, uh, but we can see between 54 and then 65% of, of pain relief was uh, obtained with the ViDisc cellular allograft quite a bit better. One of the things that's also interesting in the VAST trial is the, in air quotes, the placebo or the saline injection. So the saline injection in the VAST trial had a whopping 45% reduction in pain. And as good as that uh, reduction in pain was for the basal vertebral nerve ablation trial at 32%, it was uh, beat handily by the reduction of saline. And interestingly enough, compared to the, the basal vertebral SMART trial, ablation SMART trial, the saline in the VAST trial, our placebo, had a better clinical response in terms of pain reduction than the active treatment in the relevant SMART trial. So I want you to let that sink in for a little bit, and it also emphasizes our point that saline is not a sham, it's an active treatment. And for, from my opinion, at least we got a better result from the cellular allograft treatment than the, the saline. I'd like to show you a few clinical examples. These are things that uh, I'm an interventional radiologist and as a radiologist, I rarely, if ever see, you know, I, we typically don't see uh, 
uh, modic type one degenerative end plate changes go away, and this was seen one month after injection of via disc. We typically don't see the improvement of signal within the disc as we see in this patient six months post. As I mentioned this, I'll call your attention to the VAS and Oswestry scores under there. As nice as it is to see uh, improvement on the MRI, it's even nicer to see clinical improvement, which that's where the rubber meets the road. We also see at this L5-1 disc, we see the modic type 1 changes go away. We see reestablishment of signal within the disc and we see a cleaning up, a shoring up, a tightening of the posterior annular fibers. And we can see that not only in uh, one level, but we can see that in two levels, especially this 5-1 disc where the posterior portion tightens and, and uh, the, the disc disruption at the posterior portion seen at the 5-1 on the left is, not, is no longer seen at 5-1 on the right. So you have some disc morphology changes as well as disc signal changes. And as Tim Ganey says, all uh, roads lead to Rome. It's not a, quite the case here, but this is uh, an algorithm that's actually pretty simple. Nobody cares about Fearman grades one or two because they're normal. Fearman grades seven or eight with modic changes are the territory of basal nerve ablation. And if the discography is negative, it, it, nobody cares either. And then once you get down to a moderately degenerated uh, a degree of Fearman scale that is confirmed by discography, this is a territory of regenerative medicine injection. So finally, we have a low back pain treatment algorithm that's something more than, as my colleague from Jersey calls it, three wax in a back, meaning three epidural injections and a fusion. We actually have things that have level one evidence that show their efficacy. So in summary, we have the ViDisc is not only the largest but it is the only trial for regenerative injection into the intervertebral disc that have sustained benefit at 12 months. And those sustained benefits are functional improvement and improvement in at least one pain responder group. And hopefully this is not an arcane trial where you have to pick a single clinical level. This is designed and has shown better outcomes uh, in two levels even than one level, so hopefully this is highly clinical, clinically applicable. And with that, I would like to say thank you very much for your attention and thanks to Vivex for sponsoring tonight. I'd like to turn it back over to our moderators. Doug, we have time for one quick question before we go to our last speaker, and, I, and we're certainly appreciative of your talk. It was really great, as you always uh, deliver uh, great information. My question is this, you know, you said all roads leave to Rome, someone told you, but in West Virginia, uh, all roads lead to reimbursement. Uh, so what I mean by that is if you don't get reimbursed, you aren't going to do any of this, right? So will this study you just presented, if it leads to FDA approval, lead to me being able to offer that to my 45-year-old patient with discogenic disease? Yes. Good question, Tim. And the answer to that is uh, defined, absolutely. Build a little bit on what uh, Corey Hunter said. The class three code has already been um, awarded. So this this has a level three code, and it it we're applying for uh, a, 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 a code one, and this study is part of the five clinical elements that will be necessary for the uh, the the level one code. So what we're doing is we're categorizing this as data for randomized control trial. The next study is called the ASAP trial, and this is comparing it not against a non-placebo placebo, but this is comparing it against uh, non-surgical management or conservative care, however you would like to term it. And this is uh, part of an amalgam. We're going to combine this with registry data and other portions of that that five pieces of data to attain the the, uh, the level one coding. So this is part of the progress. We're on the road and hopefully we'll be there soon. That's so uh, so helpful, and, and thank you for all the work you're doing. I think it'll help a lot of patients, and uh, we appreciate it. And your answer just now leads us to our next speaker, who will talk about integrating our practice with Dawood. So no offense to any of the other speakers, but uh, we did save the best for last. Uh, Dr. Jackie Weisbon is going to go over how we really, you know, in integrate all of this amazing technology into your practice. Jackie. 
Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, that would, it's, it's ironic, you know, save the best for last. I appreciate that. But I think one of the things that I really wanted to say is that um, when we we're thinking about this, uh, Lake and my dancing, thank you. Um, so we know that so many people come to our practice with multiple etiologies of low back pain. And I'm not going to spend all this time going through because it's been a long evening already and I don't want to bore you. But I really want to get to the point of how we can talk about implementing this. So we see that one of the major things that we get referred for, our number one patient comes in is like, what are you here for? Not I have low back pain, I have lumbar degenerative disc disease. So we know it's common, people are aware of it, it's a finding. So um, like, can you forward this slide? Or I, thank you. Um, so again, when we look at the demographics, what we're seeing is that the majority of patients, I mean, if you look at your, I live in Napa, the majority of my patients happen to be elderly. Um, so 93% of those patients on average are going to have some degree of degenerative disc disease. If you can go next again, Lincoln. Sorry. Um, so when we see this, we have to think about why is it happening, right? So as patients get older, um, for whatever reason, some are more prone to developing um, less height in that disc because there's loss in the nucleus propulsus or there's like cellular dehiscence or uh, a, a tear like we've talked about numerous times throughout the evening. But the reality is that these are areas where people are loading their back commonly, and not just the fact that the facets get loaded, but as the areas, it's like a cushion. So I think about it when I'm explaining to my patients, it's their knee, right? And a cartilaginous um, thing that's kind of supporting this joint. Uh, next again, Lincoln. So when you think about what do you do for these patients? So if you're having that amount of patients coming into your office and there's um, you know, 12 and a half people, million people in the world with chronic low back pain and eight and a half million of them are because they have disc herniation with radicular component or spondylolisthesis or stenosis, but there's a good portion that just have pure discogenic back pain. Mm -hmm. And some of them are going to respond to the conservative therapies and there's going to be a huge oh, amount that don't. And Can't so you have about yeah. half a million patients who are still going to be candidates yes. for biologic therapies. Yes. Yeah. Next. data from Vestra. So again, we have very few treatments for these patients as opposed to just doing conservative therapy, which many patients don't really respond to. Over the years, we've developed reparative therapies like IDET, discectomy, nucleoplasty, um, fusion, disc replacement. But at this time, there's no approved regenerative treatments on the market. So what do you do? Uh, next slide. I'll call you right back. Hey, so I think Doug's uh, treatment algorithm was really mm -hmm. great. I mean, it's helpful to think about it. I actually didn't know about the modified experiment scores until we started talking about this um, because I'm sure most of us don't use this. But I think one of the things that we have to consider is how do you integrate this? So next slide. I'm sorry, it's slow. So this is a grading system. It's basically a system that is useful for people um, for multiple evaluators to be able to compare discs. So that's why it's something that many people use to evaluate disc degeneration. Um, next again. Okay, so again, we have multiple treatments at this point though. Um, the most important thing is that all of these treatments that we've had over the past few years, we've had a number of patients who are not necessarily successful. So at this point, we've seen a movement or migration to biologic therapies, right? Um, unfortunately, they're still in their infancy. And so tonight, there's over 300 of us that are on this call because we want to learn about these new um, different types of things that we have been on the market and seeing these different cells it's not stem cells right it's something completely different that we're talking about with these regenerative therapies and it's really interesting to see how things are coming along next Sorry, the slide's all in advance. So when I think about how to integrate a new therapy into my practice, the first thing I'm thinking about is how to make sure that I have a plan in place. So I wanna make sure I have educational materials. Um, again, making sure that my patients are aware that this is not a stem cell or just a fluid cell product that they can get somewhere else. And then I'm thinking about which patients. So we already know there's about half a million patients out there who have the ability to be a candidate for this. You can look at your current practice data and mine for ICD-10 codes. The problem is, is that you might not actually have those codes listed because there's really not a lot of treatments that you can do other than conservative treatments. So again, making sure that you have an established plan of care and knowing that you're gonna have prices and things laid out 
and having a protocol so that your staff is not kind of questioning, oh, how do we incorporate this? But understanding that this is the protocol, this is how they are going to get worked up, this is the treatment that they're going to get. Um, I think that when you're incorporating a new therapy, the most important thing to understand is like, what is your end number? For me, like after seeing this kind of data, I want to see maybe five to 10 patients in my clinic that are gonna respond well to this. If I can't reproduce that within those five to 10, it might not be something that I continue with. But I think after seeing this kind of data that we've been presented tonight, it's really an interesting um, thing that I'm really excited about and look forward to seeing additional data throughout the years. So thank you. Jackie, I think that was really good. You know, I think the question for someone like myself is, you know, we have, uh, for example, when we came out of COVID here, we were, we we're very busy in the clinic and I've done surgery every day the last two weeks uh, to catch back up. And my nurse practitioners have been seeing the patients and doing a great job. But, you know, what's the, what do you think that the, the integration is? Is this going to replace some other therapies you're doing or is this going to become a uh, very specific uh, centers of excellence type therapy? I think it's going to be something that is going to become more widespread. Um, I think the reality is, is that the majority of us have had some kind of training and doing a discogram at some point in our fellowship, um, even though many of us don't continue to do it as actively in practice. It's something that most of us are you know, comfortable with. Um, similarly, as we've seen like Relieve-In and other therapies come about, I think at this point, it's what do you do for these patients who have failed other interventions? Uh, and epidural is kind of like, well, why would you do this for someone with just like axial low back pain? You can't even get it covered. Or, so I think at this point, it's kind of something in between for a patient like you talked about earlier, like Kaz's mom. I wouldn't do it for an 85 year old lady, but maybe a younger, healthy person who's coming to my office who wants to get back to their activities, but has failed other interventions. That would be the ideal candidate that I'd be looking for. Great, great. Thank you so much, Jackie. We appreciate Thanks, you coming Jack. on and great job. Dawood, final thoughts from you and then I'll close. Yeah, I think uh, I really would like to thank uh, all of our speakers who uh, volunteered their time to enlighten all of us on this really new and emerging field. I'd like to thank uh, our sponsor, Vivex. Uh, just a quick uh, announcement that, you know, this was a CME accredited event. So uh, claim your event within the next 48 hours. Um, and we look forward to having you guys uh, for our next webinar coming up in the near future. Tim? We're going to have some, well, first of all, we are going to have our main in September. It's a, it's a go in September 17th through the 20th in Miami. Uh, can have, for those of you who just finished your fellowship or are still in your fellowship, we'll have a lot of these innovative new products, including some regenerative medicine in the cadaver lab on Sunday. So the Young Guns hand on cadaver lab. I think that'll be very important. Also, I will tell you that uh, you, there were several questions tonight we couldn't get to. Uh, Krish um, um, Chakavarthi and Deepan. Um, run a well, newsletter uh, every month for us, and we'll try to answer these questions in our newsletter. So we'll try to get our faculty to answer those for you. So be watching out for for that from Deepan Patel and, and Christian Chakravarti, and uh, uh, look forward to seeing that those answers for you. Lastly, I'll say this is a great webinar, and this is, we're going to be doing uh, in the next few weeks uh, radiofrequency ablation DRG, and they'll all be, be CME accredited, and, and really give you some some credits since you can't travel as much right now, but. We certainly appreciate your time tonight, your effort for joining us, making yourself a better physician, because that's the goal we all have to help our patients. So with that, I wish everyone a, a great uh, weekend and hope you have a long, nice holiday weekend. God bless everyone, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone.